Adams, our co-host. Daniel, good to see you this morning and this week. Happy Monday, Dr. Paul. It's going to be a cooler week this week. Oh, I know. Going well, to get some yard work done. We don't have to get any coats out, but we might not be able to go out uh, in our pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not. <laughs> so, but the problems remain, and uh, I saw an article today that fascinated me because I talk a lot about coalitions. Yeah. And uh, to me, there's two different things you can do. You can get people to work together. Sometimes they call bipartisanship isn't coalition building. Bipartisanship is each side uh, gives up something and they come together. So they more or less sell out. And, you know, a lot of people see some positive thing there because, you know, they can't get anything done unless they do something. Uh, well, in my case, most of the time, I don't want them to get anything done. But if they come together, uh, because they just happen to have, uh, you know, the same beliefs from different spectrums of the, of the political spectrum, uh, I think that's as good. And there is one here. It happens that this coalition uh, I don't like. I, I just don't like, like what's going on here. But I'm afraid it might be true because I've been trying, as you have uh, supported, Bringing people together from different factions, we talk so much about progressives. We are excited about, you know, Tulsi's announcement and emphasizing foreign policy, all of these things. So this to, this to me was exciting. But this one is, here's, here's the uh, he headline on, on, on that. The neocons, we know who they are, and the woke left are joining hands and because they used to fight with each other. But the, neo, the neocons now are people that dropped out of the Republican Party because uh, in spite of their hawkishness, they weren't hawkish enough and they didn't like Trump. And leading us, they're claiming the neocons and woke uh, since they're, they've joined over the militancy uh, of our foreign policy and leading to us to woke war number three. And uh, uh, people are talking about it and, and I think it's exaggerated more than I happen to believe, but every day tomorrow, you know, the nukes are going to fly. Let's, let's hope it's not that bad. But the philosophy is there, and uh, it's part of this system to agitate, uh, to prop up a government uh, in Ukraine that is artificially created by us. At the same, at the same time, uh, you, you know, demonizing Russia when uh, as bad as they are they are quite the enemy of people who start wars so uh, th this is this to me is interesting because uh, uh, especially under the circumstances that Tulsi you know picked this issue that was her big emphasis on the war issue so uh, and, and others others uh, are expressing themselves about it uh, we we do know that there's a couple candidates out there that are taking a stronger position than they have over the years so i guess what i'm doing is keeping my fingers crossed that we're seeing the signs of a significant movement but if we don't compete with this coalition and come up with a, a better coalition of people who are for peace and that would be libertarian constitutionalists and uh, also uh, progressives. They, they should come together because they do agree, at least in the past, somewhere along the way, but uh, some of them, you know, get pushed around for purely political reasons or, you know, financial reasons because the military industrial uh, complex is pretty powerful. But uh, I think this is where we are and let's try to Take, take what we see here as an incentive to, to try to combat this type of, uh, of uh, coalitions. Let's go ahead and put on that first clip if we can. Take a look at that. Uh, this is from Newsweek. You can put that first one up. And then uh, here we go. And then, um, so this is uh, David Sachs, venture capitalist, host of the All In podcast. He has this fascinating piece in Newsweek, Dr. Paul, that you talk about. And he starts out by talking about Elon Musk, and we've talked about this last week. He got into some big trouble last week because he simply tweeted a peace plan uh, for Russia and Ukraine. And he was hammered. The Ukrainian, as you know, the Ukrainian ambassador to Germany <coughs> told him to blank off. And, of course, then when, when uh, Musk said, well, you know what, I've given you guys $100 million worth of free Internet, Maybe I will blank off and you won't get any of it. And then that flipped out. So he's talking about how 
there's this new coalition, as you point out, Dr. Paul, of the woke left, which dominates Twitter. It's a Twitter swarm. If you dare say anything, they will come at you with everything. They'll get you banned. They'll mass report you. I know all about that. They mass report you and you're gone. They make stuff up and you're gone. And how they have reached a kind of ideological agreement with the neocons who love war all the time. And I would say, I mean, if you look at the history of neoconservatism, uh, you, uh, you will see that actually it's not that far from the woke left. And, 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 and Sachs points it out in this piece. They both love cancel culture. The neocons never wanted to debate, for example, in the run-up to the Iraq war. They didn't want to debate it. If you weren't with them, then you were with Saddam. And they said that about you over and over, of course, in Congress. If you're not with sending billions and billions to Zelensky, who not long ago everyone was saying was corrupt as heck, if you're not for that, well, you're with Putin. And you know, go, yeah, no, me. no, go ahead. No, no, just excuse me. Uh, but this cancel culture, uh, I, I think it points out what they really uh, believe in. They believe in cancel yeah. culture, and therefore they don't approach this from a either left or right principal position that war is not good. And uh, I think there were a few people, a couple, as I see, stood up at an AOC meeting. AOC, you know, she got all that, all that of attention, you know, and, and actually, uh, you know, it's a healthy sign that uh, uh, she's losing a little bit of her steam. But can you think of anybody getting as much positive coverage? I mean, she was every place and, and on big magazines. And, and, and you know, it, it, she could have been, uh, you know, in a truly libertarian society, if one person out of 10,000 pops up and says, you know, I'm a communist, they'd probably just ignore them. But they didn't ignore her. But all of a sudden, it turns out that she is, uh, she is not such a consistent uh, person in, in being anti-war. And what we saw in that little uh, uh, briefing, the little press conference, a lot of anger. And you just wonder, was it just this one person or two people that said, uh, you know, you, you're a fraud? Or are there others out there? I would think, I would think there's more progressives out there. And uh, I, that, that, that's uh, one thing that I, I hope Tulsi's able to keep moving on this and keep building this and drag back those, uh, uh, those progressives that have had disordered, deserted, uh, uh, you know, the uh, anti-war position. And for those few that have not seen this clip of uh, AOC being confronted at a town hall, let's put on that first 27 seconds of that when we get that queued up. Because she's having a town hall, she's having a great old time in the Bronx, wherever she's from, then all of a sudden she's challenged from the left. This is a great little clip. Congresswoman, none of this matters unless there's a nuclear war, which you voted to send arms and weapons to Ukraine. Tulsi Gabbard, she's left the Democratic Party because there are a bunch of war hawks, okay? You originally voted, you ran as an outsider, yet you've been voting to start this war in Ukraine. You're voting to start a third nuclear war with Russia and China. Why are you playing with the lives of American citizens? You're playing... Why are you playing with the lives of Americans? Why are you playing with our lives? She did not know what to say when she was confronted. And there were, this goes on and on. The, another fellow stood up and said the same thing. Yeah, I, you know, and, and this to me is healthy. What, what bothers me at times, though, is they're exactly right. You know, these wars are bad. And there's a principal stand to get, be against the war against the war. But where, where we have a little bit of a problem with even a good progressive on the war issue, what about a war against the, uh, against the liberties of uh, people in this country with, uh, with welfareism, socialism, corporatism, and all the other things where, uh, you know, what was their position, say, on uh, passing out uh, vaccines and things like that? And so often, the war issue is separated. Remember how frustrated we'd get when we'd get a coalition that'd vote against, you know, sending troops. But if we could just put on sanctions of them, that's a war, you know, uh, you know, putting on sanctions and tariffs to try to punish people. That, that is, in a way, a, a preliminary or a actual war that could, you know, just morph into something violent. And we see that all the time. But I think that's the difference between authoritarians that come from a different position. But, you know, the purpose is not to bash them because uh, I want to make that point only because, uh, 
you, you know, they're right on this thing, on right on the war. And I think, yeah, you build your coalitions, and they know that too. They've taken, they've taken the neocons now, and the neocons have walked over there, and they, uh, you know, are working with progressives because because they like the war and they hate Russia. But they really, uh, they they look at it narrowly in war. But they're they're corporatists. Uh, who benefits the most from these wars? Uh, where where are they on the military industrial complex? You know, it, it, I, I'm confused on exactly where they would be. And that those are the kind of questions they ought to be asked. Yeah, absolutely. Let's put on that next, um, not audio, but the regular, the next JPEG, because there's a couple things from Sachs's piece, and it's a great piece, really worth reading this article, and it's, it's a pleasant surprise that it's in Newsweek, because this is one of those articles that really hits the nail on the head, captures the zeitgeist. So a couple of those things from here, it says, what makes the I stand with Ukraine version of the Twitter mob unique is that it brings together two forces that used to be sworn enemies of one another, the woke left and neoconservative right. Slightly dispute that, but that's okay. It turns out they share many of the same loathsome ideological and personality traits and have similar slash and burn approach to political engagement. It's a new political marriage. And let's do this next one. If you can, I'm just going to continue reading. A regional, this is uh, skipping ahead a little bit, a regional war turned into the First World War because all parties made maximalist demands and assumed others were bluffing. It can happen again, especially if the media, social media, and foreign policy elite join forces and use woke cancellation tactics to preclude any discussion of any alternatives. Right now, we are locked in an escalatory path, and the destination ahead is Woke War 3. Very good point, because he, he's making a point here. And by the way, read the piece. He's no fan of Putin whatsoever. He cannot be called that. He calls him unhinged. He calls he's, lost the, he's off the rails. He's not a fan. But what he's saying is, if we can't even discuss whether this really is in our interest, if you can't have any discussion or debate, then we are on a one-way path to oblivion. And uh, the one person that's upset about any of this, if there's a decrease in funds, which there isn't, is Zelensky. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what arrogance to come. And the American people just seem to, oh, uh, you know, when, when are they going to get upset? They're a little upset compared to maybe when they were moving into Iraq, but not really upset because it, they feel so hopeless. But maybe, maybe there, we need more candidates, though, that'll stand up yeah. and state these positions. And uh, that's, uh, that's why we, we should encourage, uh, you know, working together at the meantime, but eventually pointing out what the basic principle is and, and uh, reject the war against the American citizens and the war against uh, people overseas. Uh, and I think the connecting thing there that should wake up uh, the progressives would be the, uh, you know, the thing that should have brought, us, brought them together on, uh, on on the pharmaceuticals, but I don't even I don't even think we had them with the pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. They they were they were all for that, and so they're corporatists, and uh, and corporatism leads too often to a combination of big government and big business, and so they're they're uh, not exactly the the progressive uh, is with us in in spirit, I think, but uh, it, it seems like. Uh, you, you, the, the, the two individuals that spoke up at uh, AOC's conference, they have to sincerely believe that the war is very, very bad, but that's only, I think they only get halfway there. Yeah. They have to see how, what else is going on, because, because if you don't have the money, if you don't have a Congress, if you don't have a president, if you don't have professors teaching this rotten philosophy that it is our responsibility to police the world and all this stuff, uh, it, it doesn't do much good. But uh, it, uh, it's, a, it's very dangerous, uh, like I said earlier, that I just don't think that next week the nukes are going to fly. But that's sure hope I'm rotten yeah. wrong on that, because uh, that would be the end of us uh, too much that we know about. Yeah. Ho ho hopefully some good will come from this. That'll, that'll be our challenge. Exactly. Well, speaking from experience, you know, I don't want to gloss over the fact that we had a wonderful coalition with the progressive left when Bush was in power. Because as much as I thought that was the case, and to a degree it was, I found very quickly that when Obama was elected, <laughs> the anti-war sentiment disintegrated. All the people, not all, but most of the people that I was, when I was working with you on Capitol Hill, most of my counterparts in progressive offices didn't want to hear anything 
when Obama started bombing, we said, hey guys, what, what, can we have a press conference? Let's, let's you know, speak out against this. No, they weren't interested. So unfortunately, not all, but many, many of them, politics really did trump uh, the moral values that they, that they purported to hold. Hating was much easier and Trump made himself vulnerable than to stand up and understand clearly and figure out how to present the case for liberty and peace uh, in order to get people enthusiastic about it. So that's, uh, you know, it's a delivery of a message challenge. And uh, matter of fact, I think that's probably one of the most important things we do. You can have all kinds of philosophies, but if you don't deliver the message right and you don't uh, get people to want to open up their minds. That's why I was more, more excited with young people because I thought I, thought I could see that excitement with, with a younger generation. Once they hear the difference rather than being uh, you know, influenced only by their professors and uh, you know, the establishment of what the government says uh, to, to go along with it. Well, we certainly appreciate David Sachs. We hope he takes a look at some of our work because uh, it was a brilliant piece and as you know, Dr. Paul, that's one of the reasons we're holding this conference next month is we're talking about cancel culture. It's really big in our society now. So thanks, Mr. Sachs, for a great piece in Newsweek. Let's move on a little bit, Dr. Paul, and this is going to go into the head scratcher category, one of these things where we don't purport to know anything. However, we note some interesting co coincidences, perhaps. Let's put on that next clip. This gentleman, Doug Brignoli, was a former Mr. Universe author of the physics of resistance exercise absolutely famous famous bodybuilder um, and here's what he wrote on twitter or on his instagram in april 4th 2021 i have enough confidence in the vaccine based on my research to get it done those of you who think the vaccine kills people can use me as a test if i die you were right if i don't die and have no ill effects you were wrong and should admit it at least uh, let's go ahead and put on that next clip Sadly, and as you said, Dr. Paul, tragically, bodybuilder and fitness author Doug Brinoli has passed away at 63 years old. That was just a couple of days ago. And let's put this next one on because we absolutely have to include this disclaimer. He passed away at 63. According to different social media platforms, the cause of death has not been revealed yet. We do not know that it was related. We only know what he claimed. Yes, and, you know, this, this is a two-edged sword in a way because... Um Let's say he, uh, t it turns out he, he had taken the shot and uh, in five years later, he always was in perfect health, which a lot of them do. A lot of people survive it, but a lot of people at the end of five years end up with the diseases that they have. But even if he did get a positive result from his viewpoint, uh, it, it, it's still, it's sort of encouraging a, a still a bad system because you don't have to have, <coughs> have 100% of the people who took the shot to die to say, well, maybe it's not a good idea. <coughs> Just a percentage or two when they're passing out by the millions of people, that's a lot of people that die from it, and then, then the unknowns. So, uh, and then when it happens, you can't glow. You don't say, oh, see what you did. You yeah. should have taken the, the dumb shot. Yeah. Uh, so so you, there's, uh, it's hard to win on it because that, that is the reason why I think our philosophy of personal decision-making, doctor-patient relationship, who assumes the risk. One thing that as time goes on, and I've talked about this for a couple of years, is they have to eliminate the, this uh, ability to, for the drug companies to escape immunity, that they can't be sued for anything. Yeah. And that, that to me is, is criminal because if, if a system works, you have to have some guiding things that is within the market system, but you can't have the bureaucrats. Otherwise you get Dr. Fauci. Yeah. And, and, and once an individual or a government or, or regulations becomes the law of the land, uh, then everybody is affected. If uh, people say, no, I'm going it on my own, I'm going to decide, make my own decision, and they get into trouble, you know, it, it's sad, but only those people that make those decisions are responsible. That is why authoritarianism and big government and corporatism is so evil because it neutralizes people. And I just think this morning there was something on TV about. Uh, it sort of was a question like, uh, if they got into trouble, how many of you would go to the government to get some help? Yeah. I, think it, I think it was like 54%. 
I said, oh, well, at least it wasn't 100%. <laughs> uh, but, but they've been conditioned. How long have they been conditioned that, to do that? Especially <clears throat> since the, uh, the Great Depression of the 30s. Well, you mentioned Fauci, and that's a great tee-off to what I wanted to put up, because I do think the rats are bending the sinking ship. Even a well-paid rat like Fauci, just watch this next video clip, and I'll set it up. He went on Cavuto talking about, and Cavuto asked him about, hey, you know, don't you think in retrospect these lockdowns were not such a great idea? They seem to harm a lot of people. He said, I'm never for the lockdowns, but so whoever put this video together, put together that, and then put together, and we'll only play a part of it, of him actually saying the opposite. It's just comical to watch. Um, but let's listen to some of this. Do you regret particularly the last one, the shutdown, the sweeping shutdown that some yeah. said made things worse? No, I, I, I don't, uh, Neil. And in fact, I think we need to make sure that your listeners understand I didn't shut down anything. I recommended to the president that we shut the country down. And the only way to do that is by draconian means of essentially shutting down a country. We know that we can do that if we shut down. Well, I think one of the things you really need to do to the extent that you can shut down mm. temporarily mm. the country, I think is important. Well, if I knew at the time- is saying here, I didn't shut anything down. And then this goes on for a couple of minutes, clip after clip of him saying, shut it down, shut it down. Oh. I mean, he's just brazen. It's just amazing. Yeah, <clears throat> doesn't phase him. No, not <clears throat> Because truth is what they make it. Yeah. Once you get in that position, uh, they become blinded to it. Uh, I, I think they psychologically, uh, you know, brainwash themselves because people can't be that nasty and yeah. live with it. They have to. They have to get sick in their mind anyway, but it's just horrible how that happens. <laughs> but it's generally, you know, he's the exaggeration. He, he may, you know, it may, you know, I'm always looking for a thing favorable. He may be a wake up call yeah. for, for people. Yeah, okay, he may be the symbol of, uh, of government interference in medical care. I think yeah. it is already. Do you want Dr. Fauci telling you what to do? And I think the evidence is so strong if we can get around the censors, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. because even though even though the, the information is getting out and a lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't dare touch those booster shots. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's still they, they don't give up easily. They, uh, they just keep pursuing it. And uh, they're, they're determined because so much is at stake. Yeah, I, I, we probably saw the same thing. I think there was only a six percent uptake on the boosters. Now, nobody wants these <laughs> shots. Yeah. So. I think we're going to end with it. I think it's a positive story. I have to confess, I'm, I'm hopelessly out of touch with popular culture. I honestly have never heard this singer. Um, apparently, he's very good because he's very rich. Um, <laughs> but let's put this up because I do think it's a good news story uh, in a broader sense. Kanye West, who purchased, quote, uncancelable social media app Parler. Now, Parler took a lot of hits, if you remember, around... January 6th, Dr. Paul, when they were accused of egging it on. And of course, subsequent investigations show that Facebook had far many pro January 6th posts than part of it. But nevertheless, they were ripped away from all of the platforms to be uh, downloaded and they basically <coughs> were disappeared. They haven't recovered. But Kanye West, who now calls himself Ye, I think, uh, he said, you know what, I'm going to purchase because I'm going to make sure that this is for free speech. And here's a couple, let's do the next clip. This is what he's talking about. Um, Parliament Technologies is the owner of Parler. It says they in entered into an agreement in principle to sell Parler to Yi, which is Kanye West, for an undisclosed amount. The proposed acquisition will assure Parler a future role in creating an uncancelable ecosystem where all voices are welcome. And I'm not going to go into the next one, but they were saying this is going to change the world. It's going to change the way things we think about this. Now, I know that he's, uh, Kanye West is controversial. He says things that are controversial that we not, may not agree with. But in some ways, that kind of, sort of like uh, Elon Musk, that kind of makes him the right kind of guy, yeah. you know, I think, to own something like this. You know, I think some questions will come up. There's one question that I hear about, and the idea is, uh, does that mean he can, people would put it in? You have to put it up? What about horrible pornography yeah. and, and, you know, a, a, a real effort to overthrow the government, this yeah. sort of thing. So there would be, there'd be li limits, but if you don't have a monitoring device from the government, 
how do you do it? Well, you do it through contracts. Yeah. You do it through contracts. Sign something, and you know there was an implied contract with uh, YouTube and these different places because they would tell us stuff over the phone, and we wouldn't do that. And and yet that is. Uh, but the contract can do that. You know that if you if you have a newspaper. And you're pretty good at reporting the news, and pretty good at having editorials. Uh, they they don't they're not required, you know, to put up garbage. Yeah. You, you know that sort of thing. So anyway, uh, I, if people worry about that, I don't think they should. If you have uh, a free market and a contractual arrangement available, you can solve uh, mo most of those problems. And it does make you wonder if, if the sort of woke movement is reaching its high water mark. Because to me, this seems like a reaction. Now, Musk's interest in Twitter for what he claims, free speech purposes. Kanye West wants to turn part of it into a free speech platform. All of a sudden, it feels to me a little bit, and I hate being optimistic because by nature I'm not, it feels like the tide is turning a little bit in our direction. People are realizing that if you run around canceling each other, pretty soon you look around and there's no one there, right? It's just you. <laughs> well, I, I think people, uh, you know, live with it, and then it gets bad to the point where they just throw up their hands and no more. And I think... Uh, when political correctness came out, that was a soft form of yeah. what they were doing. They would just ridicule you and different things. And uh, I, I think in a way uh, that is what brought Trump to uh, the attention. Uh, he, he, he was not smooth at it. His delivery was a little bit different than what yeah. I would do. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was there and uh, he could do it. And I think the people loved it, you yeah. know, this political correctness and, and now this uh, multi-genderism, -gen I think, I think they're finally <laughs> getting sick of that. That makes me ill because <laughs> they've crossed the line as far as I'm concerned. Because when children end up getting surgeries with no parental permission and butchering these kids, yeah. and uh, it, it, this, the stories are so sad that that, that, is, uh, that is a real abuse. Uh, that, that to me is a, is, is a crime. Absolutely. So. Well, I'm going to close it out, Dr. Paul. Um, thanks to our live viewers. I'm watching your chat right now, so behave yourselves. Um, and go ahead and give us a rumble. Give us a... Uh, uh, Rumble Rant. Uh, we appreciate those that have donated on Rumble Rants. That's a nice thing. If I had one right now, I'd read it, but I don't see one. Uh, so step up. <laughs> Just kidding. But thanks for your support. And cancel culture. Quit on that last clip, please. Reminding you, you should know this already. November 5th, Lake Jackson, Texas. We're going to have a great little panel, breakfast panel. It'll go up till about 1, so from about 9 till 1. Short conference on cancel culture and the war on speech. This is the issue of the time. Dr. Paul, as you say, without the First Amendment, none of the other ones make any sense. <laughs> Very good. I'm going to close with one more little item here because I think uh, the headlines are so important. And this one seems pretty benign. It says, Ukraine spends $5 million to shoot down a $25,000 drone, drone, making the point of the insanity of all. But the only thing I would correct on this, <laughs> Daniel, is what I would say, who's spending this money? Why don't we say United States taxpayers spend this money in order to protect uh, against the weaponry that we probably paid for someplace else? And, uh, and, and what, what, what do we do? How, how many billions of dollars of weapons did we leave in Afghanistan? You know, the whole thing is totally absurd. That's why, you know, Either you're involved in, in interventionism and policing the world and having running an empire and have license to steal by printing money, uh, or you don't. And eventually the one side fails, and that is excessive debt usually comes to an end. And the silliness and this foolish policies and great nations have generally always failed by inflationary pressures. Print the money if you need it and also overextend the country overseas. Well, do you think we're getting close to that? <laughs> I think we're there, and I, I think sudden changes in all the markets uh, 
are going to be rather sudden. And the other day we saw a day when the market was up 500, down 1,000, up 1,000, all in one day. Uh, that's, that's not much stability. And uh, pe people are getting confused about what's happening because what we have rejected is a definition of the unit of account. And uh, whether it's a, a unit of account for money or the unit of responsibility by the politicians not to lie to us and uh, not to allow the people to come in and say, well, you, that's, uh, that's it. Even, even the former CIA agent says, well, that's what we're supposed to do, and then giggle. That's what they taught us at school, how to lie, cheat, and steal. What do you think that what we were in there for? The CIA. So that was a big joke, yeah, but unfortunately it was pretty true. But I, I do want to uh, express my appreciation for all of you to uh, tune in to the Liberty Report. Uh, please come back soon.